Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the MIT Comes to the West Coast annual event. Um, today, we've, we've got uh, 73 of the greatest first year MBAs we've had this year. And, uh, oh, oh, I was going to introduce you, but if you want, no, no, no. Do you want the dramatic entrance or not? So, um, so we have 73 new MBAs here, and I'm going to try to go through the countries, and I'm going to forget them. But before we do, uh, my name is Bill Ouellette. I run the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship. And every night you should say Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship before you go to bed. <laughs> and if you want me to say it, just give as much as Martin Trust did, and I will say it as well. <laughs> um, but anyway, I want to make an announcement today that's important. Uh, as all of you students know, and, and many of you are graduates, the entrepreneurs in residence play an important role at MIT to help make the experience what it is. Uh, we feel we have, and I'm very confident at this point, as good, if not better, experience for entrepreneurship than any place in the world. And it, it's a lot has to do with working with people who have been entrepreneurs. When you come into our center, you're greeted by, by people, but there's at least three people there who have started companies and gone through, you know, how do you make payroll? What happens if you miss payroll? What happens when you fight with a founder and there are irreconcilable differences? You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, and today is the first day for our newest EIR, Nick Meyer. Would you please stand up, Nick? And Nick, <laughs> you, you never know what's coming, Nick. Um, and Nick has been a multiple entrepreneur. He has been out here on the West Coast. He went through Y Combinator. He's very involved in that program, and he's going to come back to, to uh, be in Kendall Square with us and put stakes full time. So that's very good news for us, and it will help bridge us between East Coast and West Coast. So um, now let's go back to um, our our uh, other guests here, we have alumni here. Those alumni, can you raise your hands? Look at them. What a learned, distinguished crew. Um, we're very glad to have you here, and thank you for all the support that you provide. Our, our students have been uh, blessed by coming out here and being able to meet with many companies. We went to one called Space today, and uh, the CEO was Summit. And he just brought four people into the room. And it was extraordinary because he said, this is the one place in your life where you're going to be the closest to average because everyone in the room is at MIT. And it, it, it was, and he really meant it. And it was very special. And they went around and talked about what it meant to be from MIT. So we not, may not be the best dressed people in the world. We might have, have the best haircuts. But damn, we know how to get stuff done. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so thank you for your support. Now, the 73 MBAs, first year MBA. Oh, by the way, do we have newly admitted people to MIT here? New admits. Are you here? No. That's not a good sign. <laughs> Maybe there's another reception going on. But, um, but I just want to talk about the students who are here. 73 students, first year MBAs, extraordinary people, all of them, from countries around the world, from not just the United States, Canada, uh, where else? <laughs> Brazil, Egypt, Israel, Spain, China, Singapore, Italy, Nigeria. Tajikistan, is that? I always get that one wrong. What is it, Tajikistan? Yes. What else did I leave out? There was Italy, we got Italy. Venezuela, Venezuela Colombia, Taiwan, Taiwan. Portugal, Portugal. France. France. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we, uh, it's, a, it's a spectacular class. And every year, it just amazes me to see the quality of the people. Our admissions are up over 30% for MIT Sloan. There's no other school out there that's seeing things like that. 
So MIT Sloan has come the place to be. And I just want to point out one of them. Where's Sam? Sam, can you stand up? Yes, Sam. <laughs> so, so this is, yeah, I won't put you on the spot too much. But today, we're, and he introduced himself, and this guy went to Dartmouth, and he was on the lumberjack team at Dartmouth. I didn't even know that there were such teams. And he, com he was telling the story how he competes against McGill University with, with their, what are they, the human? Yeah, they, so they're D1 sport in Canada, the Canadians keep their taxes and food doors to make sure they're pressurized properly. <laughs> So just when you think you've seen just when you think you've seen it all, <laughs> along comes Sam, <laughs> the lumberjack from Dartmouth. <laughs> so all I tell you is please, you know, after this we're gonna have a, a great guest speaker, but please go around and get to meet the, the wonderful people here because at MIT we really want to build a network of people. And it's not as powerful as other schools. Um, because we're a lot less formal, but let's, let's try to change that by, by uh, helping each other out. Because I always say the, the, the law of the jungle from Rudyard Kipling says the strength of the pack is in the wolf. That means a pack is strong because the wolves are strong, but the strength of the wolf is in the pack. So if we can make a stronger pack, it helps all of us to change the world, and that's what we want to do. So with that profound thought from, <laughs> from a kid's book, We'll move on to the program. <laughs> All right, so our, our guest tonight, oh, by the way, if you notice these two things, see how this was not designed by MIT, this was designed by Stanford. And you can see, you can see this chair is much higher. So, but we fix problems at MIT. So, we don't care what it looks like either. <laughs> All right, so our, our guest tonight is Stephanie Fone. Stephanie is a seasoned startup executive and entrepreneur who specializes in leading emerging technology companies and bringing products and services to market. In 2013, Forbes recognized her as one of the 11 women executives leading high growth private companies. And she has also received a Stevie Award for Women, in, for women of the Year in Technology. Stephanie was CEO of White Hat Security Better than, better than black hat security, for sure. Um, for a decade during a period of exceptional growth, taking the company from eight employees to 300. Most recently, as CEO, she, she positioned Remotium within the rapidly evolving mobile virtualization market for a successful acquisition in only eight months, selling the company to Avast Software in June 2015. Please join me in wel welcoming Stephanie Fone from the MIT Sloan class of eight, 1988. Okay. I don't think you'll need your name tag. <laughs> no, I'm going to hide that. For a minute there, I didn't think I was going to get to talk. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what kind of happens in my classroom, Stephanie. <laughs> okay, I'm hiding this. But we'll give you plenty of time to talk. Oh, no. I shouldn't have even said that. Okay. <laughs> Just kidding. No, we like to trade insults. <laughs> so, well, first of all, welcome, and we're honored to have you here. And why don't you just go back to, you know, I always find it interesting is to find out where people started. Tell us about where you grew up, your family, how you ended up, you know, in college, and then your path from college to MIT. How's that for an open-ended question? Okay. Um, yes. Okay. This is where I say that I grew up a poor, no. Um, I actually did grow up in a reasonably small town in central Washington, ag-based, so where we grow apples and hops and cherries, called Yakima. And um, yeah, it was a place that um, many kids didn't go to college. And so I was um, one of the fortunate few. I had a very smart older sister and she went to the University of Washington and in Seattle, and I followed her there. And um, I, um, <clears throat> when I got to the UW, and I was in classes with 750 people, 
and um, I was taking you know a double load and getting A's and everything. Then I finally figured out that I might be smart, right? I might be smart, and so um, I started to apply myself and. Um, Graduated with a couple of degrees, a degree in business um, and a degree in psychology as well. And, um, and then I went to work for Chevron, the oil company. They would recruit all up and down the West Coast. And um, I was very interested in the intersection between business and technology, you know, even back then. Um, though, again, didn't have an engineering degree, but, uh, you know, I focused on um, IT in the business school. And um, so while I was there at Chevron, I um, was in their management development program and um, made my way to um, IT audit. And, um, but when I was there, I always knew that I was going to go back to grad school. And so um, I applied to a lot of graduate schools and got into a lot of graduate schools and um, chose the Sloan School, chose MIT. And for me, it was really because of that interest in um, how technology and business intersect. So that's really what brought me to Sloan. So I will not go into any more detail there. Wait, wait, we, we gotta know, we gotta know, you're not an oldest child, are you a youngest child? Middle child. All right. Middle child, I was yeah. the hard worker, that was me. Beautiful. My sister was the brain, my brother was the jock, I was the hard worker. So. <laughs> Often neglected. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, by the way, if you have questions, please, you don't have to wait, just uh, tweet them to this hashtag, and I'll pick them up when we, when we get to that part of the program. So you, you, end, up, you end up at, um, you've come from, um, when you were working for Chevron, where were you working? Where were you based out of? I was based in the Bay Area, so I got recruited and came down the Bay Area. So you're, so you're in the Bay Area? Bay. Yeah, in the East Bay. And you end up going back to, the, to, to MIT. Yeah. You know, so you spent two years at MIT Sloan. What did you do between your first and second, be, between your first and second year? Let's see if I can remember that far back. <laughs> I worked for HP up in Andover. So you stayed on the East Coast. Yes, right? I did, yeah. But then when you were done, you, you beelined back out here? Yeah, yeah, I came back out here. Now, why is that? Well, it's one of those long stories, but um, it was, um, let me see, I was married at the time to my first husband, and um, he was really the one that drove um, the move back to the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. So, but I like the West Coast. So, I, you know, it was something that was important to me as well. So, uh, you know that the, the students are out here to understand the ecosystem out here right um, and you know the west coast and let's uh let's talk a little bit about that because um what's it like out here that's different than the east coast so um so first of all and you know it's amazing when you do these things and then you have these bright lights so basically i can't see any of you it's just a mass of people like there, there, I can see you. Um, so one of the reasons why I went to work for Chevron is I came down to the Bay Area and I fell in love with San Francisco as a city. So, you know, Chevron likes to do that. They recruit people. They, you come down for these visits and they put you up at the St. Francis, you know, in a nice suite, you know, in downtown. And it was just so glamorous and the city is such a wonderful place. So I really fell in love with San Francisco. So. Um, that was a big draw for me. Um, I think that there, you know, having spent so many years here, so basically I've spent my entire adult life in the Bay Area, except for the time I spent um, at MIT. I realized that we have, you know, just an incredibly thriving, you know, ecosystem for entrepreneurs. And that's something that you can, um, you know, get in you know smaller ways in a lot of different places and there's a lot of computer security entrepreneurs that um you know there's beltway companies minneapolis seattle san diego right there's there's different pockets obviously on um, boston 
but um, the Bay Area is the place to be, basically, if, from my perspective, if um, you want to start a company or build a company. It's because of the resources and the environment, the people, you know, the attitudes are so much, you know, geared toward entrepreneurialism. But what they, you know, um, Northern California is different now. San Francisco is much different than the peninsula, right? Silicon Valley is, is different than San Francisco, is it not? Well, I consider it to be one big ecosystem, right? So I lived in San Francisco for 10 years, and now I'm down in the valley, I'm in Menlo Park. And really when you're looking to start a company, sometimes you look in San Francisco, um, sometimes you look mid-peninsula so that you can draw you know, people, talent, from the South Bay as well as San Francisco and everywhere in between. But the funders are generally the same, right? So you get the, the funders, the financial partners, you know, generally come from Sand Hill Road. Certainly there's a lot of VCs now that are in the city, but, um, but yeah, I don't see any difference really between the two. And I would love to hear your thoughts on why you think it's different. Well, having spent so much time out here. Yes. I just <laughs> arrived here last night. Um, <laughs> no, what we hear from our students is that San Francisco, you know, is the place to be. Mm. Um, and, it's, and that's more of the, um, the heavier technology is down more in the valley, the more enterprise stuff. But even now you're seeing Okta and some of these other ones in San Francisco. <laughs> and that's, that's the cooler place to be now than down in in uh, Palo Alto region, down the peninsula. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's good. It's good to keep in mind. <laughs> okay. I think, I Hypothesis mean, tested, <laughs> yeah. not proven true. <laughs> so so let's, get, let's get to some of the other things. Is the, the, the computer security area is really something you've, you've, you've done very well in and is an area of great concern. We visited uh, a company today called uh, Space, and they're just on fire uh, with what, what they're doing. Um, and they're talking about the opportunities in this area, and they're saying, you know, this is fundamental. And, um, and Bill Swanson, you know, this has become over and over again, you hear this. You know, everybody needs, to, in the IT area, needs to be concerned about security. Mm -hmm. um, do you buy into that? or? Hypothesis? Oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So, so what advice would you give to people today? So are you talking about um, advice to people with respect to entrepreneurs that want to develop products? Do they, should they care about security? Or whether entrepreneurs should specifically focus on developing security products? It would be both, it would be, it could be both, but what I was really focused on is mm -hmm. security is not something that's separate anymore. That's the takeaway I took from it is, mm -hmm. he was saying the product managers are calling up. It used to be there was a security group in the company. Right. At, 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 at this major company that called up and he said, it's a product manager. He said, why are you speaking to me? He said, because I can't release my product unless I get it, unless I deal with these security threats. That's good, that's good. It sounds like they are farther along than, than many. Right? Mm -hmm. And so it sounds like they're very um, progressive in this area. But it is true. So um, when I started in security in the mid-90s, it was, um, you know, basically a well-kept secret, right? And um, it was just the beginnings of um, the web, right, and um, communicating. Um, via the internet, and so this industry has grown in importance um, over the years. And so, and it started out that people were focused on the network and the infrastructure. Then people realized, you know, very quickly that it's the applications also provide um, attack vectors, right? Web apps, you know, um, regular applications. Um, known code, you know, customized code, and then obviously every time there's a new platform, you know, now being, you know, mobile being very important as well as IoT, is that security really needs to be built into every layer, right? Um, 
You need to be thinking about security um, from the very beginning. And that security is not a, a, you know, something that the IT guys do to keep you from using your devices, right? It's not something bad, but it is something that um, enables business, right? And that's something that's been a big shift over the years. <clears throat> and obviously from an entrepreneur standpoint, from someone who has focused on developing solutions in this area, it's, um, it's just phenomenal that it's gone from being <clears throat> a disenabler to basically a business enabler. So it's very important. So while we're, while we're scanning it, there's the rapidly evolving mobile virtualization market. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what that means? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, okay, so we can, um, we'll talk about the rest of my um, background later, but um, most recently I um, was CEO of a company called Remodium, and it's a computer security play, it's a mobile security play, but it's security through virtualization. So um, you have your device, right, but um, all of the applications and the data, they don't sit on the device, they sit on the server because everything is virtualized. And so if you lose your phone, if it gets compromised, if anything happens to it, it doesn't matter because there's nothing that sits there on the phone. And that's something that um, Remodium does and um, we do in a very unique way. And um, there are other players in the space, but it's, it is a new space, which is why there's room for small companies. But it's not too dissimilar from what um, Citrix does. You know, they virtualize um, Windows desktop environments, right? And it's just moving that to mobility and also enabling um, granular controls as well within applications. So, um, so yeah, so with Remodium, it was a great situation. I came in post-seed, pre-A, was a, a really tight, strong technical team. And um, the technology founder, CEO, brought me in and then he moved to the product role. And um, he and I worked very closely together and we were out raising the Series A <clears throat> when we got an inbound offer from Avast Software. They're one of the antivirus companies out of um, Eastern Europe, so or Central Europe. They're based in Prague, um, very strong company. And they were looking to really focus in mobility, and so we became their enterprise mobility play. And so it worked out really well. It was a short stint for me, but it was a great outcome. It was, what, eight months? Yeah, yeah eight, eight months. months. From November to June. So had you raised your A by then? Or nope. was this, no, we were so out this, there. So you went directly from seed to sale. Seed to sale, yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I, <laughs> I well, would recommend it highly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because one of the catches is, is when you get into Series A and you bring in a big name VC, they have these things called preferred shares, yeah, yeah. Which, which if all of a sudden someone comes to buy you, Right. They say, no, 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 no. You're, and you say, yes, 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 yes. And they say, no, 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 read the preferred shares. We're blocking it. And you say, but this is a good deal. And they say, no, we want to get 100x our money. You know, 10x isn't good enough for us. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, well, there, and there was a professional um, VC, Draper Nexus, was in. Oh, with, oh really? Right, with the preferred, yeah. So, um, so we did have um, professional VC management. So who but, from Draper Nexus? It was um, Rio. Rio? Yeah. Because okay. we have two of the Draper, Drapers in tomorrow. Mm, okay. Right? Yeah. Who is, it, who is it that we have, Nina? Rio. What? Tim and Adam Draper. Oh, okay. So um, Draper Fisher Jurvetson has, you know, the broader um, oh, okay. global. So Draper Nexus is one of the DFJ funds. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And it's. Um, Rio Maeda and Mitch Kitamura, and they have okay. a lot of Japanese LPs, and so they do cross-border stuff with Japan. So, yeah, good folks. But that is a good point because it is, um, I'm a big believer in early exits, actually, because of the dilution that comes with continuing to raise, right? You know, the more you raise, the more dilution you take, and um, also you really have to be careful who you partner with, right? I think everyone sitting in this room, I'm sure, knows that. But um, 
you really have to be careful. And you don't always have more than one choice, right? And so um, it's, it's a risk that you take. And that's interesting because it seems out here in Silicon Valley, over and over again, people say, here's how much money I've raised, here's how much money I've raised, as if it's that's a, a measure of success. Yeah, exactly. And yet you're running counter to that, <clears throat> yeah. and what and you say. You're sounding very East Coast. Well, it's funny, and, and also with our um, wonderful unicorns, right? Yeah. I raised this much money as these um, guys I know well um, that raised, tenable raised $250 million in a round. And, um, and the valuation wasn't disclosed, but it had to have been well over a billion, right? And so, yeah, that's a marvelous thing until you want a real exit, right? And yeah. that's what's happening now in the marketplace. So there's this huge shakeout because, you know, these um, companies that have been um, funded at these high valuations, they're not worth that. And they're not going to be able to go public anytime soon at the, those types of valuations. So um, it becomes a huge problem. Yeah. Say one other thing too. There's another company I know that shall remain nameless. That's um, a company in um, our space, in, in White Hat space, in security, and they took a round at a high valuation, and they're ready to go public, but they can't because now that valuations have come down, they can't get the valuation that they need to get the the last guy in has to get his return. And sometimes now the um, growth equity or private equity players that come in at the very end will take ratchets and things like that. So, so they want to make sure that they have their return at IPO. And um, if you can't give them that return, then you're stuck. Mm -hmm. And so that's not a good place to be. So I, I want to come, come back to this. Like you were, you were saying something, and the power of role models and I really, I, someday I want to write this, this, this article, the damage Mark Zuckerberg has done to entrepreneurship. Because everybody thinks Mark Zuckerberg is a role model for entrepreneurship, and I, I'm, not, I'm not pouring haterade on Mark Zuckerberg. I'm just saying that that's like saying, you know, Le, LeBron James is an example of how to be a basketball player. He's, he's a statistical outlier of kind of an individual that happened in one time and space. Um, and it's more often when you look at the research that's done that things are done in teams and collaborations with heterogeneous teams that, that, that come about. Right. And that's, that's what we teach at MIT Sloan. We teach the more systematic way. Mm -hmm. So after that ad, um, <laughs> yes. can, can, can you, if you, had, if, you, if you had to take a role model that you said has really not been a good role model for other people, are you willing to go there? No. Why not do it the other way? <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm going to do that next. All right, so let's go, let's be nice. Um, I mean, I can certainly talk about people that have um, made mistakes, but yeah, I don't... Yeah. Let's, let, so let's go to the positive side. Who would, who would you pick as a role model then of how this is, this is what we should look at going forward? This is, you know, if you want to optimize your odds to be a successful entrepreneur, mm -hmm. look at this role model. Okay. Look at this role model. Okay, well, we'll start with um, Art Wong, who none of you know. See, this is my thing, is that my role models are going to be within the security industry. I suppose I could, um, you know, look beyond that, but again, the security industry is really, is my world, right? Um, the Valley, too, but really specifically um, the security industry. And um, Art Wong was a very successful entrepreneur, um, three times in a row. And um, he always started with um, core teams. And his focus was, and the reason why I mentioned it, is his focus was making you know, those core teams all a lot of money, right? And, and that was his idea of success, not just that investors would make money, but that um, you know, everyone would make money. And of course, you know, we would build products that have value, right? And that um, that um, that are important, and um, that people buy and want to use. But um, that was really his focus, and um, he worked well with his teams. He gave them autonomy, and um, I was a member of his team at Security Focus. And, um, and he was a believer also in um, early exits, a believer in serial entrepreneurship 
and um, it's okay. You don't have to. You don't have to be the next Google to be a success. And if you, you know, if you grow like with Security Focus, we grew the company to about 75 people. We were doing eight million in. Um, we were on track to do eight million in revenue, and we sold to Symantec. Um, this was in 2002, and um, you know, made great return for the investors. The team made money. Uh, it was very successful. And we sold for, it was sub 100 million, but it was a very, very successful exit. Now, there are certain venture firms that would not even have invested in the company because that wasn't a big enough exit. And actually, in the, you know, the late 90s and even in the early 2000s, that was a reason why a lot of the VCs stayed away from security was because a lot of the exits were sub 100 million at yep. the time. But still, you know, you can have a great successful run and then you can do it again. And Art so far has done it three times. Um, now he's running the services business for HP. So now he's got a big job for a while. But I think he'll come back to it. So what were his three companies? You just named one of them. Um, so Secure Networks. They created one of the first vulnerability scanners. They sold to um, they sold to Network Associates. It's called the Ballista Scanner, and then um, Security Focus, which uh, you know I teamed with him and a smaller group um, of folks. And then um, the most recent one was Iron Key, which is another successful security company. So um, you took a company from eight employees to 300 employees. Mm -hmm. That's scaling a company. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's yeah. interesting because we have a lot of companies now, we just have a new class called Scaling Entrepreneurial Ventures, where we now have this, people are becoming entrepreneurs and they create a company that gets up to like 10 employees. But going from 10 to 300, that's a big deal. That's, that requires not just you know, entrepreneurial passion, that requires some management skills. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. How did you do, can, can you get into some of the key things as to how you did that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so again, it, it took time. I was with White Hat. Um, the company was founded in '02, so again, it was um, kind of right after um, the crash of the '90s, I guess we'll call it now. And um, so it was a tough time in terms of finding talent and getting funding. Um, I joined the company when there was eight people, and that was in uh, mid '04, and then. <coughs> grew the company from there. And over time, I raised over 50 million, um, five zero, 50 million in funding, um, and grew the company from, you know, and again, I can kind of say verbally, it's not something I can put on paper because the company is still a private company, but um, grew from, we were like 250,000 in revenue to, um, and so in security, it's, you need to break through. You sell first to the early adopters, but there's a lot of companies that never make it more than about 10 million in revenue, maybe 10 to 15. And so um, it was nice to have broken through, you know, that plateau and, and really been able to grow the company to a larger um, to a larger size. And I think the key things really, and this is why I like to do it, right? So this is why I'm an entrepreneur and. The reason why I do what I do is I'm not a technology visionary, but what I like to do is come in when there is a small team, you know, less than 10 people, and that's consistent throughout my career, right? Remodium, White Hat, Security Focus, and even prior to that, um, Tripwire. Coming in when the team is very small and um, coming in as CEO, that's when, that's when all the creativity happens. That's when the fun happens, you know? Um, I may not be the one that has the idea for the product, but I'm the one that gets to decide, you know, what does that product look like? You know, who's going to buy it? You know, how do we go to market? How do we position the company? And when I say I, it's certainly not just me, right? But I get to lead that process. And that's something that's just a pleasure to me. And. Um, I think it's um, the most exciting time in any company's life, you know, are those early days. Now, obviously, what happens as a company grows over time is you adjust and you get to go through these processes 
more than once, right? And maybe it's incremental, but um, you get to look at your existing product and then you say, okay, how can I complement it with another product? Or we're going to market directly, maybe we can um, open up a channel. Should we try to take this down market and um, sell it to SMBs? Do we develop a freemium model, right? So that people can use this and try before they buy, and then you can get a grassroots type of go-to-market strategy where people will adopt on their own and the product will grow from there, the product adoption. So um, it really is an exciting time. And so the key things are to build a good team, to build a good team, and um, to then once you've built that team, and obviously that evolves over time, you, um, I'm really scrunching down too, because I'm trying to get like under the lights, I feel like I'm scrunching down, I'll sit up here like this. Um, you have to let them go, right? And I think that culture is so important. And one of the things that I think I've known for is um, having a very low ego, right? And I don't have to be the smartest person in the room, and generally I'm not, so that's easy. But, um, but basically I'm considered, you know, a, a team member like anyone else. And in the end, you know, um, oftentimes I have to make the hard decisions, but um, I, I run a very collaborative shop, right? And I think that's just so important because those people are there for the same reason I am. It's because they want to create things. They want to utilize their talents. And so you've got to let them, let them do their job, right? And um, that's really fun. And then I think that um, it's just important always to, as I mentioned, you have to keep adjusting. So that's what running a business is about, right? It's never create your five-year business plan and then execute on it, right? It never happens that way. The world changes, and the most successful companies are the ones that can change, change with it, right? So, keep the questions coming in. Um, I have one from Teddy Lee um, that says, "Stephanie, how did you select your post MBA job, and how do you suggest mm -hmm. we go about picking a startup in today's job landscape?" It's mm -hmm. a good question. So, um, actually, so when I got out of Sloan, I didn't go right into um, a startup. I, I had a path, and it would be um, probably behoove me to talk about that a little bit. I told you I went to Sloan because I was interested in the intersection, right, between IT and business. And so, you know, I was determined, you know, to go into IT consulting. That's what I wanted to do. And it made sense, right, follow my path. And then, of course, when we got to the second year, I'm sure this is something that has continued over the years, but when I graduated, it was, venture capital was, was the hot area to get into. And I talked to a company that we would call a private equity firm today. Back then, they were doing a mezzanine equity investing and leverage buyouts. And I um, talked to that company, and I got you know, so enamored with the idea of um, you know, working in that field that I just abandoned my, <laughs> all my plans. And, um, and, you know, in hindsight, I think it was the right choice because, um, so I went to work for this firm, it was called Berkeley Gavette. We were in the pyramid um, in 89 when the earthquake happened. So, um, you know, right there in downtown San Francisco. Um, great firm, I got to see a lot. In, in that kind of world, you get to see a lot. And I got to see basic businesses. And I learned financial engineering, is what I call it. And obviously, LBOs are all about financial engineering. And I learned how to you know, understand how um, the numbers, the financial statements, reflect, you know, how they reflect what's going on in the business. And um, that was a very important lesson for me to learn. But what I did is I stayed with Berkeley Gavette um, in that area, and then I joined a couple of colleagues of mine that spun out and had their own investment banking firm. I'm called Alliant Partners and joined them for a couple of years. And then we did an M&A with a woman named Marcado Silvera, who was in the um, voice services business. And she sold her company to MCI, and then she got tapped to be CEO of a startup called Pilot Network Services. And she pulled me over, and um, 
she pulled me over as her director of business development. And that's really what moved me into the operating side. And um, so, but having that exposure to lots of different companies at a very high level and having to actually analyze entire segments um, and, you know, technology segments very quickly, it, it was good, you know, it was good experience. So, okay. so this one comes from Lampakey. Um, among your ideas and interests, what's your process for deciding which company to pursue next? How do you choose? Yeah, yeah, that's a great one too. Okay. So, since I'm going through that process right now, um, it's very relevant. So, I think that um, for me, again, um, it's very important that I find, you know, a strong technology team to work with. And it could be that my next gig, I'll think of something on my own and we'll actually, you know, start it from the very beginning. But um, that's less likely than that I will find, you know, a core team and come in and work with that team. And so, and really this has happened, you know, three times because I would include security focus in that as well. You have to find a first time technology entrepreneur that's willing to say, hey, I really want to build a great product, but you know, that fundraising stuff and all that go to market stuff, I'm going to let you do it, right? And um, I think that's, it's not that easy to find, right? Because entrepreneurs by definition, right? We're all control freaks, right? So, um, so I think that that's a, just a huge factor for me. And I've been very fortunate that I've been able to find teams where this could happen and I could come in and you know, be a key part of the team from the very beginning and um, not be seen you know, as an outsider. Does that make sense? So how did you find them? That really is a needle in a haystack mm -hmm. because finding a founder that's been successful mm -hmm. and gotten it from one to 10 people and then says, well, you know, I'm looking for a business person to, uh, yeah. to, to, to give the lead role to. Well, it's, an, it, it's usually an ego problem. Yeah. It's a control yeah. ego problem. It's, yeah, exactly. How do you find these people? This is very, very interesting. So with and you've not done it once. You've not yeah. done it twice. Yeah, I've done it three You've times. done it three plus times. And, and again, with um, security focus, I was COO, and R yeah. was our CEO. So a slightly different situation, but um, you know, did have similarities. And um, with security focus, I was brought in by um, you know, it's all relationships, it, it has been. And um, I was brought in by um, a colleague of theirs who's the VP of marketing. Um, we knew each other and he thought that I would be a good fit for the role. White Hat, it was a little different. It was the investors that were pushing. So the, the um, technology entrepreneur had gotten the company started, had raised about a million dollars and, you know, and thought that if they built it, you know, they would come, right? And um, so really didn't have an idea of how difficult it is to bring products to market, especially in the security industry. Um, and so I knew someone who knew, you know, one of their investors. And mm -hmm. so they brought me in. But again, in that situation, even though the investors brought me in, it wasn't... Um, it wasn't a negative, right? It was seen by that technology entrepreneur that, that I could come in and help and that it would be the right thing to do. And then finally with Remodium, it was really through a relationship, CEO of another company, and he said, hey, yeah, maybe you can help those guys. And I started out advising them um, and, and then ended up coming in as CEO. So it has a lot to do with your reputation too. Yes. And people, it's word of mouth, which, yes, exactly. which so often yeah. happens. In, in you, its relationships. And again, in security, it's a very small world. It really yeah. is. Yeah. It's not like you put a cover letter together and sent it out to a bunch of people. No. <laughs> they, no. they called you up. Yeah. Uh, this, one, this one comes from Dennis Lolly, and it says, you're team-oriented and clearly a winner. Where is he? <laughs> <laughs> well done, Dennis. <laughs> yeah. well done. How do you identify and hire other great team players and winners? Yeah, yeah. He's available. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Obviously. So yeah, I think that also comes down to 
relationships, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, I feel like at this point in my career, my highest and best use, right, is staying in security because I know a lot of people. But it also is, um, you know, getting out there and getting to know people and um, leveraging your existing relationships to meet new people. Um, and so, and I think, again, in the Valley, it really can be tough because right now, you know, it's really hard to find good talent, right? And yeah. especially, you know, on the software development side and, and things like that. So um, it's, it's getting so competitive and there's a lot of companies out there, you know, scrabbling, you know, for the great teams. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. So I wish I had, um, some magic advice, you know, in terms of doing that, but it's it's really just putting yourself out there and getting to know as many people as possible and building your networks. So um, I have to jump jump you, Justin, for a second here because Lisa Taco, is that a Norway flag in the background, Lisa? <laughs> Lisa, where are you? Is that a, is that a Norway flag in the back? <laughs> She's from Florida, so we don't understand why, why there's a Norway flag in the back. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Entrepreneurship is tough and risky. How do you decide when to make the plunge with an idea or venture? This is very, very common, and, and you probably remember your days. Well, it's, it, there's a lot of pressure now. You have 73 people majoring in entrepreneurship and innovation. Right. And, and there's exactly. like this, I want to do a startup. Why can't I do a startup? I don't seem to have an idea. Or is this a good enough idea that I should right. take the plunge or not? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, I have to say that um, I'm glad that when, well, actually, I can't say that, because even when I came out of grad school, I never would have been an entrepreneur straight out. So I, would, I didn't have that much, you know, self-confidence at the time, to be honest with you. So, um, so for me, it was a journey that got me to the right place, right, to what I love. So, um, and um, it was an important journey. And so, for those of you that feel ready now, um, I'm an angel investor. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> you won't get out of here if you say that. <laughs> um, I, I would still recommend, and I know most of you have already had um, work experience, but I, I think it um, makes sense to actually work for someone first, and then you can, um, you know, maybe it's in product management, you know, maybe it is in a startup, or maybe it's in a medium-sized firm, or maybe it's in a big company, but you learn, right? You learn things on somebody else's dime, right? And um, so I would I'd say that even though that's not what you want to hear, right, that there's something to be said, you know, about, you know, getting that foundation behind you. Um, if you have a great idea you think is great, um, what you want to do is bounce it off of other people, um, basically. Now, again, that's risky if it's just an idea. But you know that t today it is very rare that um, companies get funded, right, off of the back of the napkin, right? And so generally today, seed funding occurs after, you know, there's at least enough of a product developed to demonstrate. And so, you know, kind of the A has become the new B and seed has become the new A, right? And so, You'll, you'll do a seed, but you have to have something there. You can't just say, hey, I got this great idea. Now, not that it doesn't happen occasionally, but um, you shouldn't expect that it happens. So, um, so there's a lot of work that is going to go into developing an idea, getting the product to kind of a demo stage before you can you know, try to raise money. And then, obviously, before you raise your A, you've got to have, you know, today you've almost got to have market validation, right? You've got to have a dozen customers that are paying you before you can raise your A. So, um, so it's quite different than um, it was even, you know, five, five to eight years ago. 
So I'm getting really good at not answering the question. Do you see how I'm doing yeah. that? Ah, I tell a story. And you should run for president. <laughs> I, I, the, uh, but I think, I think, can we have time for one more question, Lauren? Okay. So there's a lot of these questions, and I, I'm going to use Maddie Wasser's one, and I, and I think this gets to it. I mean, a lot of, a lot of people here um, want to get into a startup, but they're not founders yet. I mean, that's one of the reasons why they came to Sloan, and, and, right. and, and the magic doesn't happen that quickly, as right. you know. Right, exactly. And so joining a startup, your, your story is very interesting to a lot of people here. Mm -hmm. um, so Maddie asks, can you discuss coming in as an, quote, outsider at an early stage and how you handled differences in opinions you had with the founders? Yeah. yeah. That's a real issue, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, again, I've been, um, I've been fortunate. Um, but I'm also I'm a pretty good communicator. And so um, both with Remodium and with White Hat, in both cases where I came in as the CEO, I spent a lot of time with um, the founding CEOs in each of those cases, a lot of time. And I remember having conversations with Sanan. It's like, hey, do you really need me? You know, you don't need me. Why, you know, you've got to make sure you need me. And um, how can we make this work? And what is it, where do you want to go with this company? And what are your goals? And so, and the same with Jeremiah Grossman at White Hat. And again, it was a little different situation, but um, it was really important to me to have, you know, a connection and make sure that we talk through the issues. You don't wait until you're there and then say, okay, now let's figure this out, right? Um, Communication is everything, right? So, how's that? You were a psychology major in, in college. Love how much? Stuff. How much did that come into play here? Oh, it's, yeah. So, I'm so glad I get to segue back to this because I forgot to say it at the beginning. You know, I've always been, you know, entrepreneurial, right? So I was the kid that was out, you know, with the. Uh, you know, the lemonade stand, you know, every day. And I remember making popsicles and, you know, all this little stuff when I was a kid. And um, so I was always the entrepreneur, right? And um, though I didn't know it, right? I didn't know what that meant at the time. And, um, and so when I got to school, I, um, I gravitated toward business, right? It made perfect sense. Um, made a pass through economics and said, nah, I'm not gonna work. So um, I went to business, but I found that I gravitated towards psychology classes. And so I ended up, you know, in my third year with, you know, really enough psychology credits to, to get a degree. And it was just really that I loved it so much. And I find, obviously, that it is very important, right? Understanding people and what motivates them because different people are motivated by different things. And when you're growing a company, you want to motivate everyone in the right way as much as you can. And um, so, again, psychology is just something that I enjoy that's easy for me. But um, I think it's something that's critical. You know, it's all about people, you know, in terms of growing companies. And so um, it was important to me. It's, it served me well. I, I know I said that was going to be the last question, but it's okay. we can change the rules for entrepreneurs. So uh, th uh, uh, this, I will try to make the last question. It's, it says, this is Mekubia. Okay, who is that? Okay, so um, it said, looking back on your days at Sloan, mm -hmm. what's one thing you would have done differently? And, I, mm -hmm. and, and, let's, and let's think about, not, not just a regret, what's one thing you did that, that put you in the position you are today? And if you, let's start with that. On the, no, let's start with the, what you would have done differently and then end with the positive, <laughs> all right? I was not a psychology major, just to be clear. <laughs> there you go, okay. Let's end on the positive note. But what would you have done differently looking back, knowing what you know now? Okay. You had two years. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, Do you remember the courses? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm just trying to think of which is the most um, politically correct 
the answer. No, <laughs> no, 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 not here, no. not here. <laughs> so, um, how about I'll, I'll say two things. I have all kinds of things I would have done differently. So, one is that I ended up um, for my thesis. I um, I got funded through um, Draper Labs, Charles Stark Draper Labs. Any representatives here in the room? Um, but by the way, just to note. There was no MBA back in 19 yeah, then. it was an MS. It, it was a Master's of Management, and you had to do a thesis. Yes. You guys don't have to do theses anymore? No, it's gotten soft. These oh, are, these, these are Actors. millennials. These are millennials Actors. here. <laughs> Enough about me. What do you yes. think about me? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, so, yeah. So I ended up doing my thesis, and, and the... Basically, I set out to get that last semester paid for by somebody and then did my thesis with Draper. And I ended up something about strategic planning and not-for-profits in technology or something like that. And it really wasn't something that, um, that um, I had that much interest in. It was that relevant. But the money was relevant at the time. So, you know, so if I had a do differently and if I had the money I would do it differently so yeah so I think in that case the thesis was actually a good thing because if you really focused on something that you loved a topic that was really of interest to you that it was something that could be very meaningful um, but it wasn't for me and then finally I would have um, talked more yeah so I was shy um, Yes, I was. Hard to believe at this point. But um, yeah, I was very shy and didn't speak up a lot. And you know, I think that Sloan you know, did a great job of bringing people out. And you know, there's a lot of group work that we did. But you know, I was quite, I was, um, I was a shrinking violet in those days. So it's different on, now. On the positive note, yeah. if you look back, what was one thing now that you say, wow, that really helped me? Yeah. Um, again, a couple of things, but um, um, I don't know, does Bill Pound still have his course? No, he doesn't anymore. Okay. So he had this course where you put together... Wait, how many people know the name Bill Pounds here? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm dating myself. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> how about Tom Pounds? He went to school with me. Yeah, Tom Pounds, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's he, he was in that class with us, but um, yeah, he was in my class. But anyway, so Bill Pounds had a course where you actually broke into groups and you were like management teams and you had to present a strategic plan to um, a board. And so that was great. It was um, role playing, basically. You had to come up with a strategic plan and they would set parameters, right? It wasn't something that we made up completely. There was parameters set and um, we worked together to put it all together and then we presented to an executive who would come in and um, I, I'm trying to remember who it was, but it was a, like the CEO or an SVP of a very large company and came in and we, we pitched him on this yeah. idea. Yeah, and it was terrifying at the time. And um, of course, then now I do it all the time. And so that was, that was good training. And then also I think we did a lot of project work, which was good. You know, work together in groups, and it was something that um, I didn't have that much experience with. And um, so that was, that was a good thing. Well, Stephanie, thank you. Um, Stephanie came back and was a judge in the 100K competition. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who want to get someone, she gives back. Who was clapping for the 100K? A lot of love for the 100K. All right. <laughs> And we really appreciate that. And for those of you, for other things, um, she's, she's a terrific resource. She's given up. She has two nine-year-old, uh, two twins. Twins. Yeah, twins. Not two twins. One set of one twins. One set of twins. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but thank you very much for all you do. And we're very proud to have you part of the community. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.